Welcome to Career in Ruins, where we switched to a folky theme tune before it was cool. It's true. It's true. It's one hundred percent true. It is true. It is true. But the highlight, as as listeners, as regular listeners, the one or two of them we have will know. In our last episode, we talked a little bit about uh, the new series of Digging for Britain, which has switched to a Johnny Flynn folk intro, and it's lovely but derivative. Yeah. Well, because we did it first, so uh, <laughs> yeah. we are the trendsetters. <laughs> that's all we need to know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How are you doing, anyway? Yeah, I'm good, thank you, mate. It feels like it wasn't too long ago since we did this. I know. It feels like I'm almost. Uh, yesterday <laughs> <laughs> well it certainly feels like we're back into the to the swing of things which is great and we had a, a great chat with Kat Jarman and then uh, we've got a very very cool follow-up interview this evening so I'm very excited to to bring today's uh, participant in very shortly but yeah how's your week been? yeah it's been good back at work which is uh a, a mixed blessing but it's nice to get some regularity again i'll, I'll say that much <laughs> good. i mean it's it's the 14th of um of january and you've only been back two days so i don't feel too bad <laughs> i think you also need to tell everyone what the text you sent me the other day about walking out your office <laughs> <laughs> i can't i cannot say that out loud can i okay okay fine fine um so the highlight of my working week this week um as as lawrence has alluded to it wasn't necessarily the busiest of weeks all the marking kicks off next week um but i walked out of my office to see my boss outside with two first year students who I hadn't met uh, which which is nice I said hello gave him a wave and they were lost looking for a, a place to do some do some video recording actually to make a, a short video for an assignment and uh, one of them said to me are you Derek Pittman Yes. From Time Team. Oh, I blushed and blushed and blushed. It's, it's it, yeah, highlight of my year so far. And I can't see, I can't see it being beaten. So it's all downhill. Um, he said some words that were. What that did I your boss call you when that happened? It was, it was rude. <laughs> it, 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 it put me back in my place. But, yeah. but grounded you, grounded you. Uh, <laughs> That's nice. That's nice. And uh, that kind of is a nice segue into, one thing we didn't highlight in the last podcast is that the podcast fans are actually funding this series and we want to say a huge thank you to everyone for that so all the money that that has been donated over the last three years over our patreon account is is finally being withdrawn and being paid to go towards sound guy guy who's doing an amazing job with the editing as ever and um, a shout out to guy and a huge thanks and a huge shout out to everyone that supported us um through over the last three years to to make the podcast well this this season of the podcast uh, thank you so much much to everyone for that because it's fair to say we wouldn't be back for this season without the support of patrons even though we haven't yet figured out how to withdraw the money but i'm i'm sure we will <laughs> as, as soon as possible um so we may as well get cracking lawrence what have you what have you been up to this week what have you been thinking about what's on your mind i can see something's on your mind there's one thing on my mind this week so we're, we're recording the day before this happens but i guess when listeners hear it it will happen it might, it might be a week after they've uh, it's come out so it's not fresh news but um back in 2018 um julian glover was commissioned by the government to undertake a landscape review for national parks and areas of outstanding national beauties in england yeah. Cool, right? Yeah, let's let's revisit these really important <laughs> nationally significant landscapes which hold um really important um habitats, wildlife, but also cultural landscapes. Um the review came out. Negligible recognition of the historic environment. I mean and heritage, negligible. As is like, tradition. Minor minor afterthought. And it, I mean, it's it's infuriating um, in the concept that none of these national parks, you, you tell me any national park in England that doesn't have foundation built on the historic, historic environment, whether that's the grazed uplands of the Lake District, whether that's the uh, New Forest common lands, whether um, it's... Um, Dartmoor and Exmoor and, and the, the moors that go with that. Where the, the way these landscapes have evolved, the way they've been created, the way that the, the past landscape management over thousands of years and decisions made by man, whether it's planting forests, whether it's clearing forests, um, 
shape everything that create these really important nationally significant landscapes. And to omit this from the report is, is a massive, massive own goal. And then the government's pickup of this is, is relatively poor as well in their, their sort of response comes out this weekend. So I'm just, just going to put shouts out there for um, everyone that loves and enjoys a national park to go out and enjoy its historic environment, enjoy everything that makes it special because of its past histories, its culture, its, its historic practices, its, its surrounding landscapes, which you might perceive as natural and beautiful, but are entirely artificial, entirely shaped by past human activities. That's a, a fantastic battle cry for people to go out and enjoy being outside in weather which is quite nice now so I, I fully fully support and endorse this message and it, it reminds me a little bit of one of the core textbooks in our first year archaeology programs um, Hoskins the making of the English landscape classic it is a classic it's a little bit out of date now and a lot of the conclusions are questionable but the the fact that the landscape has been so modified and manipulated to become how it looks today should make that central to any 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 story of enjoying being outside. So I fully fully support you in that, Lawrence. Our national parks are more than just um, a, a Disneyland that that is they're there to be enjoyed for recreation and uh, and wildlife. Their their history, their purpose, their creation comes from historic land use and his, the historic environment. So let's let's celebrate that and let's champion that better than we do at the moment. That's a well thought out run. You've put more thought into this than usual. It's, it's almost like it's my PhD <laughs> theme. <laughs> <laughs> it makes me feel a bit lightweight because all I was really thinking about today is how Elsie came home from school with some Roman homework and I know nothing about the Romans. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, surely you know something about the Romans. It was depressing, actually. The, the list of questions she had to answer, she's like, I'll ask Daddy, he's an archaeologist. Uh, it was awful. <laughs> um, a crippling, crippling anxiety follows about how... <laughs> <laughs> Little I know about anything I should know about. But did you caveat everything with, but if you get me a piece of um, the artefacts, I can shoot it with a phaser and tell you exactly what it's made of. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what I said. Did you? Yeah. It looks like something out of Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but Romans are overrated anyway, right? Yeah. Greeks are much better, I think. Yeah. 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 And I think I know someone else that might might agree with that. And that is, that is a very tenuous segue into me introducing our guest today, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. See what I've done there. <laughs> <laughs> so today we are absolutely honoured to be joined by Natalie Haynes, who is a writer, broadcaster, classicist and comedian, um, written some incredible books, often heard on Radio 4, seen on the telly and has the, the illustrious... Um, the illustrious something, I've lost my words, of being my number one listen to podcast on Spotify in 2021. Honour, honour, <laughs> uh, I think. The honour, yeah. that's the word, yeah, the honour. Yeah, yeah. um, with Stand Up to the Classics, which if you haven't listened to it, and you're still into podcasts after having got this far into ours, then do go away and listen to it because it's incredible. Um, I'm sure I've missed lots of stuff out there because um, Natalie's CV is, is broad um, and her wikipedia page goes on for a very very long time so there's lots on there um but natalie welcome thank you for joining us Yay! oh thanks for having me i can't believe you didn't bring roman homework for me to do <laughs> i was so ready <laughs> so what's the one sweet what's the one i was right here <laughs> but don't, but ask, but ask. what did the romans use for toothpaste oh i don't know oh I know, that's that's that reads all the stuff you get down by the toothpaste apparently mouse ah. brains was the answer but um i need to go and look into that a little bit more i mean that doesn't sound plausible <laughs> no, but okay no. it sounds vastly implausible <laughs> yeah. um. you need like one mouse per every what two teeth <laughs> mice are really small they have really small heads how would you get it out would it be a scooping action i don't know <laughs> A melon baller. Wait, we haven't invented melon ballers yet. <laughs> I feel like toothpaste is going to get invented before melon baller. The invention ballers. of the melon baller was for mace braining. Is that a thing? <laughs> <laughs> the first person to add some spearmint to some mouse brain must have been like absolutely coining it. They're in. rich as creases. <laughs> Colgatios, yeah. I believe, was the name. <laughs> <laughs> Natalie, welcome. Hi. Oh, it's so good to see you. I think last time we saw you, I think what Derek did miss out there is also you're one of the fantastic new presenters of the, of the two new Time Team episodes, which are due to come out in spring of this year. I mean, we sort of turned up and made them and then they've disappeared forever, haven't they? It's like Brigadoon or something. <laughs> <laughs> it turns up every hundred years. <laughs> it seems oddly appropriate. So, yeah, that's where I met you guys. Yeah, I mean, it was a fantastic couple of weeks, but it was an absolute joy to have, uh, to have met you in 
person for the first time. It was so lovely. And it's so nice to have got you along for, for the podcast today. Um, I don't know if you've had a chance to listen to any previous episodes. Uh, you'll be forgiven if it's a bit too niche for you. But um, we're going to go hopefully go for a nice meander through your, um, your career to date and then take you through a few uh, set questions that we like to ask our participants. So all right. If that all sounds okay, we, we might just hit the ground running and let's do just it. ask you to give us a nice overview of your career in ruins. It's sort of a succession of different ruins, um, one on top of the other, like all those <laughs> Troys. It's basically that. Um, I started out as a stand-up comedian, which I started doing when I was a student where I was studying classics. So classics and comedy always sort of went together for me, but it didn't really occur to me it was possible to combine the two because the comedy circuit in the 1990s was quite low-key, <laughs> to put it mildly. Um, and uh, there just wasn't... People sometimes, you know, now assume that I did what's basically the radio series, that I would do Natalie Haynes stands up for the classics at, like, the comedy store. <laughs> Not really <laughs> on the Friday Night Late Show. <laughs> Didn't really have that many jokes about Latin. <laughs> um, so I was a stand-up for ages, about 10, 12 years. And then I sort of made a sideways career move I wrote for, uh, I wrote op-ed, so comment for The Times for a while. And that is a job I sort of got by mistake. And I I feel like I have to emphasize this because it feels like the sort of way that um, people narrate their career. Like, oh yeah, I just happened to be in the right place at the right time with my, you know, billionaire godparent. (laughs) Um, I don't have one of those. I genuinely was sometimes in the right place at the wrong time but loads of times I was just I just missed you know I I missed out loads and loads and loads of times so I guess if I have one kind of take home from it it's that persistence is um if you don't have enormous family wealth (laughs) if you are for example from Birmingham like me um then um persistence is probably more useful than um any of the other things so I did a tv show and I hardly ever did TV, but I got booked to do it because the talent booker had heard me on Radio 4 and she'd heard me on Radio 4 because they had come to hear me in Edinburgh at the French ah, Festival. Okay. And they had come to see me perform because I'd been nominated for the Perrier Best Newcomer. So, um, And that was very unusual for women to ever get nominated for anything in comedy in those days um, at all, ever. It was an unbelievably um, fallow-centric profession, <laughs> uh, to put it mildly. And so Radio 4 were there and then they broadcast a chunk of my material and somebody heard me. And then I was on TV, literally sitting next to um, the man who commissioned people to write for The Times. And he thought, basically, you're funny and you've got some narrative sense. And he had um, a column going kind of spare because Alan Corrin, uh, father of Giles and Victoria, was sick at the time and it had been his for a long time. Um, And so he said, could you write Alan's column for me this weekend? And I was like, sure. And then probably rang a friend who wrote for another newspaper going, I don't know how to do it. What do you do? She was like, just do this at the start and that at the end and then you want the middle. Great. Um, So I had a column in the Times for a a few years in the end. And then I made a sideways move to the independent because I wanted to do the same work, but for less money. Um, And and sometimes that's how journalism went, (laughs) I'm afraid. Um, and then I started writing books. Um, so I wrote a column in The Times at their their request um, when Gordon Brown became prime minister, I think. And they said, could you do us a... They knew I was a classicist and a bit of a nerd for ancient history because I'd, you know, randomly dropped things into columns before. And they said, could you, could you do a, like a parallel? Who's he like from the ancient world? In fact, can you do like loads and I said yeah sure no problem so I wrote you know he is like this Tony Blair is like Augustus he is like Tiberius you know quite grumpy not in terms of the sexual thing, <laughs> obviously uh, just to be clear I'm sure he isn't grumpy but comes across as grumpy and then Tony Blair was sort of master of spin you know the sort of first among equals vibe um and, uh, and so I did this and um, and it was one of those columns that just people write in, like loads of retired colonels wrote in for about a year going, Ms. Haynes appears to believe New York, here we go. Um, and uh, and because of that, I sold um, my first uh, nonfiction book, Ancient Guide to Modern Life, uh, which came out in 2010, which I think is 20 minutes ago, but isn't. Um, but I really wanted to write novels. And I tried to write a novel. See, you should talk about the failures. I tried to write a novel before Ancient Guide. um, And then we were trying to sell it at the time of the financial crash. And nobody would buy it. So, um, and it was really devastating because I'd written the whole thing, you know, like 80,000 words. 
and nobody wanted it. And now they all want it. Well, it's too late now. <laughs> it broke my heart now. We're yeah. not friends anymore now. If it wasn't good enough then, it's not good enough now. Screw you, suck it, et cetera. So, um, you know, sometimes it really, my point is sometimes it really hurts and you feel like a terrible failure and it's still okay in the long run. Not always, but sometimes. Um, and uh, so I wrote Ancient Guides, but then um, I wrote a novel called The Amber Fury, which was published as The Furies in the US. Um, and that did okay didn't set the world on fire did fine and then i wrote a novel called um i should know this children of Chicasta. <laughs> she did a little bit better and then i did wrote one called a thousand ships and that went gangbusters because it got shortlisted for the women's prize um and then it went crazy um, and became bestseller in america so that was really really unexpected because all my previous books had sunk like stones in america <laughs> so it was like i'm honestly I, people got into publishing in order to reject this book i swear to you there were people who went for a job interview and they said what can you bring to this company and they said i'm confident i can reject natalie haynes's next book and they went come on board um i mean it was rejected by like 30 people and then suddenly it found a home um by uh, with a publisher who'd already said no to it but eventually changed their mind so you know it, it wasn't a lovely smooth path of success um at all and at the same time as all of this um i started doing live shows that combined my sort of love of comedy with my love of classics um so they're probably a bit funnier than a regular kind of normal talking show and probably a lot more history than a regular comedy show on radio four but we've done seven series of that now so we record the eighth one this summer it'll go out in september i think which is when my new book comes out so that'll be a lovely relaxing time <laughs> breathe into a paper bag so that's it. That's everything I've ever done. That's amazing. There's so many things to pick out there. I mean, the the, the main thing that I've written down is attrition. And sort <laughs> of underlined it about 50 times. It does sound like um, certainly from that step into um, writing in the Times and, and coming out of the comedy circuit, it's been somewhat of a war of attrition. Do you remember what that first piece in the Times that you wrote was about? No. You don't? I just don't. I don't remember anything from last week, though. So that's, <laughs> that's not particularly a surprise. <laughs> no, I don't. You're right about the attrition, though. I sometimes get asked, especially when I talk at schools, about how you kind of have a, a media career um, or a career in the arts because they look so impossible from the outside. And there's some justification for that. You know, it's it's a it's a really closed off world, and it's really hard to smash your way in if you don't have family. If, for example, your parents were teachers from Birmingham, and um, the answer I always give is pretty well the same, which is that you basically just have to smash your head into a brick wall for as long as it takes for the wall to break and you have to pretend it doesn't hurt the whole time. And it is really painful and really, you know, hard going. And it's still way better than going down a mine. Um, mm. I used to work in, you know, Blockbuster Video long ago and that was way worse and way less well paid. Um, but it takes a really, really long time of doing things with no return. That's why I like things like running, where you go for a run and you're slightly better at running than you were yesterday. It's like, I like that you put this in, you get the same thing out kind of equation and you never get that with anything to do with the arts or media. You know, you you keep pushing, keep pushing, keep pushing and nothing, you know, you write th literally thousands of words of pitches, nothing, nothing. But then suddenly the offer comes in from a completely different direction. You're like, wait, what? Um, and you did nothing for it. And it, it's, in a way, it's as frustrating. It's just nice frustration instead of the bad kind. Sounds broadly comparable to a career in academia, which is quite comforting and terrifying. Yeah, less paperwork, though, which is, yeah. <laughs> you know, would kill me. It just would kill me. I don't know how you do it. I practically get hives just thinking about having to... I, I don't... This is a terrible admission to make, but I will make it for you. I no longer, as of this year, say yes to universities because I cannot face the paperwork it takes to get paid. I just can't That is do it. completely understandable. And I've been gradually, over the years, I've been adding a sort of tax to university gigs to so that I get paid, you know, so that I can pay somebody else to spend six months chasing the freaking thing. Um, <laughs> and now I can't even be bothered to do that. I think they're insulting Pauline, so I won't have it. I'm like, no. So, yeah, I'm sorry if you're at university. I would like to come, but I, I literally can't do the paperwork. I'm too tired. I'm too old. I can't do it. <laughs> it's, it's gobsmacking in its, in its bureaucracy at the moment. Yeah. Um, to the point of having, hopefully no one from my HR department listens to this podcast. Um, it's very unlikely. Too late they do. now. <laughs> um, but uh, but the, um, even external examiners who are working in different different nationalities, different places, have to hold their passport up to the bloody Zoom screen to 
identify their right to it's just nuts yeah it is nuts and the thing is at every stage somebody in hr sorry your people (laughs) uh, somebody in hr invariably goes oh it's not our fault it's the government and it's hostile environments this is that as though i'm only following orders is you know generally a great defense um and it's like you know i hear what you're saying and yet everyone else i work for manages not to be this much of a dick so you always have the option of (laughs) you know, not being a dick and just go, oh, the system is just like that. You literally work in the system. Make a better system. Try me a river with how hard it is for you. Is it really? Tell me again about your holiday pay. I think the the obvious solution to that is to make the system more complex and have more layers of administration. Anyway, I'll I'll stop now. I'll stop. I'll stop. Stop talking about other people's ruinous careers. What all universities need is way, way, way more managers and way fewer (laughs) academics. And especially good if all the academics can't have tenure or, you know, any kind of job security at all. I'm going to completely agree, but very quietly. (laughs) (laughs) But the the sort of mental image of banging your head into a brick wall until it breaks while pretending it's okay sounds (laughs) sounds very familiar. Yeah, you can't do that. That though because your walls are more valuable than mine <laughs> maybe that's why they're, they're ruinous walls yeah. but um uh, <laughs> what, what you have described there and you mentioned natalie that the, you didn't have a um a wealthy background and everything that you've done is through a lot of hard work and, and loads and, of luck um, loads, of, loads luck. of luck but derek and i will always say that you make your own luck and you you have described how that luck has being created by yourself there in that you kept banging your head on that wall you kept taking up opportunities you kept writing your books and and putting yourself out there which is it's a pretty inspiring message to put out to anyone starting off in any sort of career whether it's in the arts whether it's in the classics whether it's in historic environment archaeology ancient history whatever it may be it's it's probably a really important message and note to put out there and that did get a lot of luck in inverted commas but you you made that luck for yourself i made some of it but sometimes you just get you know the right thing just happens on the right day but you see the opportunities and you take them for sure yeah Mm. but i mean equally i screwed loads of them up do you know what i mean said the wrong thing was in the wrong place you know sat next to the wrong person didn't realize who they were you know didn't have my glasses on or you know that all those things also happened it's just that over a whole career they probably balance each other out it always used to drive me crazy i know you guys are tennis nerds too because we were all watching emma raducanu um, <laughs> in separate rooms everyone and before you all get stressed that we were breaking covid rules to watch the tennis we weren't it was work we were watching it was work it in we our know separate Beijing. rooms and texting each other from our individual work parties um and um I, every time it used to drive me crazy when you know somebody would get neck cord after neck cord in the same match and, you know, some blithe commentator with seven Grand Slams to their name would be going, yeah, well, over a career, over a match, they level out. Over a career, they definitely, you go, well, that's all very well and good, but what about today? <laughs> but it's true. I, I now kind of have come to the point of thinking, yeah, it's true. There are times when I have properly cried over, you know, things that just went wrong, um, you know, people I couldn't win over, uh, virtues that other people couldn't see that I was convinced existed within a project. But you know what? I also got lucky a bunch of times in ways that I did nothing to earn, but just was in the right place at the right time. And it does probably balance out, but it doesn't feel like that on the bad day. So if you're having the bad day, person listening, um, it's not you, it's them. Everyone else is awful, but it'll be better tomorrow. Uh, One of the notes I scribbled down as you were talking was, it's okay to fail. And I'm going to write that on my wall, I think, because it's, again, a great message to to our listeners and I know a lot of our listeners are early on in their career and sort of just stepping stepping out into the world of of the job market or figuring out what they want to do and learning to be comfortable with failure is is hard and it's it's brutal it's really painful (laughs) it is mm. and it feels really personal it feels like it's you who's being rejected and if you want to feel that to the max can i recommend stand-up comedy <laughs> there's literally a whole room full of people is judging you at once finding you wanting and performing their disappointment to everyone around them in terms of facial expression and silence so yeah i, I mean you survive that for a while and and you can survive more i think but there are probably easier ways of getting to the level of relative equanimity that i am at than a decade on the circuit very nice, very nice. Um, you, you mentioned the classics at university. Which uni was that? I was at Cambridge. Cambridge. So was that a three, four year course that you did? Mm. 
Yeah, three years. And and yeah. would you do your stand up in Cambridge as well? Were you travelling around? I did. I did footlights. So I I went the old school way. So I should have been a sketch performer, except I don't act um, and wouldn't know where to start really. Um, I just liked stand up. And honestly, I wouldn't have done comedy at all if I hadn't. And this is a I'm afraid terrible admission, but here we go. Um, if I hadn't simply fallen for an extremely handsome man, <laughs> um, and there was an extremely handsome man at a college that I wasn't at doing a subject that I didn't do. Um, and I wasn't particularly imaginative, truthfully. So I clearly found a friend that we had in common and went, have a party and asked me to the party. And uh, she appropriately did that. And he was so good looking and really sweet. Um, and we probably didn't have anything in common in truth, but these aren't things that distracted me when I was 19. Um, <laughs> and he said, I think you're the funniest girl I've ever met. Um, which obviously isn't hottest, but it was workable. Um, and I said, oh, we should do something for Footlights, thinking, because this way I will get to see you again. And he said, yeah, I'd love that. And I said, yeah, me too. And then, you know, I don't want to shock you. Obviously, I took him home. It was the 90s. We did that sort of thing in those days. Um, I say as though I would not do that sort of thing now. Because <laughs> now, obviously, blameless existence. Um, and, uh, and you know, we, we dated like 20 minutes. Um, and then he broke my heart to a thousand shards, as boys always did in those days. Um, uh, but he he turned up at, at my room like two days later with a sketch that he'd written and it was I'm so sorry it was so awful it was just really really terrible and he said what do you think and I was like oh yeah I'm just working on mine and the only thing I really knew how to write was stand up because I thought well I can do a mon I understand a monologue I didn't really understand any of the rules of drama yet you know I was still too new to understand how to write a sketch so I wrote this monologue and he literally walked me he spent the night again I'm sorry um, he literally walked me to the audition for this um, cabaret night and then waited outside so I couldn't just run away and I was auditioned by oh Robert Webb of Mitchell and Webb um, as you do yeah well in those days he, he was just another student to be fair oh, okay okay um, oh, yeah. and they gave me a, a like five minute slot in the in this cabaret show and then I, I nearly threw up for the entire... It was like the next day. The whole thing seems mad to me now. I, 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 was, I always think I was so meek. I must have had nerves of steel because it was the next day and I just walked out on stage in front of 227 people, which is what the ADC Theatre in Cambridge used to hold, and, and was so nervous and spoke so fast because I was so afraid. And I still do talk fast, so I guess that, that didn't wear off that much. But... Uh, yeah, and then that was that was it. Like I say, the the boy chucked me and my heart broke, but stand up kept me, uh, you know, solvent. Let's say for ten years or so. I wasn't sure if you were going to say that his his terrible sketch that he'd written just put you off completely, and you're a bit like, oh, well, it's not the end of the world. He, he. I mean, where were you when I was nineteen and needed someone to point that out? I just needed someone to say he's just good looking. Exactly. That's all he is. He's just good looking. Just a bag of meat. You don't have anything in common. He's just good looking. And I'd have been like, but his hair smells nice. It doesn't matter. <laughs> he's not funny. You could pick someone more appropriate for his hair, etc. Yeah. No, I was a, the most feckless 19-year-old. <laughs> I've got one more question, if that's okay, before we move on to our, our yes. set questions. Like, ideally, it's to... not going to be about people I had sex with, but I was going to graduate. <laughs> Let's see what happens. Well, I mean, yeah. I, I can't guarantee that this won't go into that. Realm. But um, our last interview was with Kat Jarman, and she, we, one of the questions we asked her was, where do you start? This was in particular around where do you start to write a book? Uh, and you mentioned you'd, you'd written 80,000 80, pounds, uh, 80,000 pounds, 80, word nice. yeah. novel. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you've written ample books um, since 2010, since your first one. Um, it, it was Ancient Guide to Modern Life. Um, and even your stand up um, routines that are still, you've got your new series that you're, you're planning um, at, at the moment. But. <laughs> Um, <laughs> where do you start? <laughs> where do you start? Like, where where do you start with with writing these things? Where do you, do you have a framework? Do you just hit the ground running? Like, it like really cat? depends. Um, they're all different. Um, a friend of mine who's a very successful novelist told me that the act of writing each novel is to solve the problems inherent to that specific novel, which means the problem is that when you finish it, you know exactly how to write that novel. <laughs> <laughs> it's not always very helpful for the others. The only thing it gives you is the knowledge that you didn't know last time and you found the way through. That's it. Um, so it's not, it, it, it gets easier, but it's not always, this most recent novel, the novel I have out this year um, in September, I think, as well as the radio show, 
is the hardest in some ways that I've written because I started it in December 20. So London, where I live, had just locked down. Um, and then, you know, I was sort of thinking, oh, I need to start this, but I don't quite know what I want to do. And I would had to write the end of the previous book, Pandora's Jar, in an incredible rush because I was so late having been on tour for six months with ships. And so I thought, oh, well, you know, I'll sort of recover a bit and then I'll start this novel. And I was like, well, I'll probably do some research. And I was like, "Mm, that's not really working for me. And so I was trying to, it's about Gorgons, it's about Medusa. Um, So I was trying to kind of find out more about Libya and the kind of Greek imagining of Libya. And it's really hard because obviously what you basically have is Herodotus who goes Libya, by which he means Africa. Right. He's there are as far as he's concerned, there's like Egypt. That's Egypt plus quite a lot of its environs. Ethiopia, that's everything south of Egypt. Um, and, uh, and Libya, which is like Algeria, Morocco. And you're like, yeah, fine, fine. Um, and I thought, well, I'll be able to find out some stuff. I'll be able to find out some material stuff about what Libya was like. And oh, my God, I, I already knew that classics was really perhaps over-focused on Greece and Rome. And I do see that I'm part of the problem. But it's so hard to find material written about anywhere, you know, in North Africa before the Romans get there. It's like great news if you want to write about Roman cities in Libya. Really difficult news if you want to track down. In the end, there are some amazing archaeological records from the you know, Libyan Archaeology Society online. And it was like, well, that's really lucky because clearly I can't travel. Um, and there are these incredible cave paintings, rock, rock art, which are just amazing. Um, and I spent ages researching all of this, thinking, well, maybe this will sort of find it. And actually what happens, of course, is that the things that you research deliberately, this is really different for fiction from nonfiction. With nonfiction, I look up the thing and process the thing and write the thing. But with novels, it's like you can't, I don't think very easily set out to go, what do I need to learn from this today that will inform my novel? You instead go, "Mm," and then you just kind of, (laughs) you buy books, you look at books, you kind of look at pictures, you're like, does that, is that giving, you suddenly find like a little glimmer, half a sentence or a a picture somewhere that just, you're like, oh, that's where I want this book to be. And there's just no, it's the whole thing is more like, you're like a whale scooping up plankton, you know, you take in all this seawater and you have no idea what the kind of little juicy plankton bit is going to be. I say as a vegetarian, is it juicy? I don't know. As far as I'm concerned, it would be like "Mm, delicious seaweed. Um, But it, it, it was just really all the things I thought I would be able to, you know, breeze my way through. And then I wrote this book so slowly. I can't tell you, Uh, you know, I know everybody had trouble with concentration and lockdown and I don't know whether it was COVID. I don't know whether it was lockdown. I don't know whether it was because it was book six. I don't know whether it was because this particular book six, but oh my God, I basically wrote a thousand words a day like this. Three words, goes and gets a biscuit, comes back, deletes a word, (laughs) writes four words. Oh, is that the washing machine? Goes and hangs up laundry, comes back, deletes four (laughs) words, has a Diet Coke. I mean, it was was just pitiful. And I would sit at my desk from lunchtime, which is when I usually start creative work. I do like email and boring admin things in the morning. I would still be at my desk at like 8 p.m. Well, I do see that's still only an eight hour day, but I I generally would write a thousand words a lot faster than that. I, it was just, it was appalling. And only the fact that at the end of each day, there was a thousand words made me kind of think I could carry on because it really, when I got to the end of the first section, it's in five chunks, this novel. I thought I'll read it back. And I was like, oh my God, these are actual sentences. And even that was sort of a shock. And then when I kind of got to the next book, I was like, well, this actually reads like somebody kind of breezed through it. I'm like, who did that? Because I remember what I was doing. I was sitting at my desk having a biscuit and crying. So somebody else must have stepped in and tapped out a few sentences. So yeah, it, it was a, it was really like pulling teeth um, at first. And then only when I was about, I don't know, halfway through, did it start to, did I start to refer to it even as a book, or even as a manuscript up to that point? I'm like, I may be writing a book, I don't know, it might not be. And it, it turned out, you know, it was a book, but I didn't really know. Normally I've got a much, you know, when I wrote Amber, the first one, the whole thing was set out on index cards because there were three timelines in it. Oh, I live for three timelines now. <laughs> ha. Um, but at the time that seemed really complicated. 
And so I'd got, and like there was like a present tense timeline and then two past tenses, but one was like urgent past tense diary and one was like a year ago past tense. So I had them on different colored bits of card and then I'd broken them down into acts and scenes. It was all very Aristotelian. And I had them all laid out on the floor so I could work out when each bit of information, because it kind of worked like a thriller, was going to be um, revealed. And there was this sort of awful moment where I looked at the floor with all these different bits of coloured card, you know, around each other and thought, if I added string between these, <laughs> this is the flat of the serial killer. <laughs> Every drama ever made. Oh, my God. So it was really lucky I didn't have string because that was the only thing that saved everyone. The, the, mm. the line between serial killer and successful author is having access it's to string. It's string. Yeah, that's it. That's the only difference. <laughs> That's incredible. And I, I just want a, a, a very brief observation based on the fact that we've recorded two podcasts this week now, both with highly successful authors. And Lawrence, you've asked the same question to both about how do you start when it comes to writing? So I just wanted to check in really a bit of a mental health check. How's that discussion going, pal? Are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> it's really hard starting a book. I, you know, I know there are people with harder jobs, but it's really hard. It feels like such a big thing. And I, you know. I can certainly relate to what you were saying, Natalie, about distractions during lockdown. And I'm sure there'll be a lot of people um, listening in now going, absolutely. I mean, it's all great. Oh, you've got all the time in the world. You've got no distractions. You can't go out. Yeah, yeah but there was nothing there. else to do. There was no reason to finish. That's the thing, I think, that made it so difficult. Not a healthy scenario, I worked all yeah. evening because it's like, well, what else am I going to do? Just sit here on my own. Yeah. Mm. Oh, yeah. Well, if I at least if I keep the book going you know, into the evenings, then I've got friends to hang out with. And when I, this is uh, so deranged, but it's still true. When I handed it in in September, so I I just didn't, I felt really elated for about 48 hours. I handed it in on Thursday night. I felt great, went out with friends, um, came back on the Thursday night, you know, felt okay on the Friday, did, you know, admin that I'd failed to do for the proceeding, whatever it was, six months, replied to an email for once. And then I just sat in the flat and cried for the whole weekend. And I was like, <laughs> what is wrong with you? And then I thought, yeah, I live on my own. And so I kind of created people to keep me company through the whole lockdown. And basically, I've just shoved them out the front door. So I was, of course, you're upset. So, uh, you know, you kind of have to give yourself permission, I think, to go a little crazy. It was a, it was a weird time to live through. And it's mm. still weird. And it's OK that we're not all kind of mm. as resilient or as boingy or whatever as we might have been before. It's all right. We'll get back. I couldn't couldn't agree more. And I think the, the shock waves and the aftershocks, I say aftershocks optimistically, I've been yeah. watching the news too much, but the aftershocks will carry on for a long time. And I think um, everyone having lots and lots of compassion and lots of flexibility and being pragmatic and nice will we'll go a long way over the next year as we all recover from it. Anyway, before I digress too deeply into that, um, you've had an amazing career and it was so nice to hear how it started and how it's got to where it is now and I'm incredibly excited to see where it goes next um, particularly when these two time teams are if they ever uh, they'll, they'll emerge they'll emerge um, if you're listening Tim um, but of all that career of all of the the things you've achieved and I've got I've got your wiki page still open in front of me now and there's tons I don't of stuff read it so I don't know what it says don't I'm, tell I'm, me I might, I might go in and tidy it up a bit yeah you go and say whatever you like I'll, I'll never sue put whatever you want make sure you put career in ruins in there don't yeah you? I will I will <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we still haven't got ours anyway that's yeah they, they rejected me anyway um, <laughs> be happy with rejections um, is there anything throughout your career if there was one thing you had to kind of say that's the thing I'm most proud of that's the thing I want to I want to scream from the, the rooftops is there is there one element that you would kind of look back on and say that's the bit that's the moment or that's the thing the product mm, that's tricky um in terms of a book it's ships it's a thousand ships it's my heart song um it came close to destroying me and uh, I'm still standing. So it's, and then of course it, it saved me ridiculously because like every other performer, I lost six months of work in about 48 hours in March, 2020, when everything just fell out of your diary for so far ahead. And I thought, I wonder how I'm going to pay the mortgage. And then three weeks later, it was shortlisted for the women's prize. And I was like, oh, there we go. <laughs> 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 That's all of that out. So, you know, I had this very weird, um, kind of pushing, pulling relationship with ships. It, it, it came so close to crushing me and then it really did save me. Um, and in terms of performance, it's probably doing the Iliad for the Stand Up For The Classics Series 5 because it was incredibly hard <laughs> to 
to try and get a 24 book poem down to 27 and a half minutes. And I wanted to do it without edits or breaks. Um, I wanted to perform it live and have it recorded like that and then broadcast like that. And in order to do that, I had to bring it in. And I didn't realise how close it would be when I asked. And my producer, I might add, was consistently telling me this was a mad idea. Uh, she was trying to preserve my sanity. But you had to bring it in between 27.15 or, and 27.45. Um, if it's shorter than 27.15, then it's not going to fill the slot that's allotted to it on Radio 4. And my producer gets in trouble. If it's longer than 27.45, she would have had to have cut it. And I really, really wanted it to go out whole. Um, and so I had to perform the whole thing and try and bring it in exactly to time. And I brought it in, I think, 27.44. And I, I, it was the most physically stressful thing, more than a half marathon, um, more than that I've ever done. And I, I was fine for about 24 hours. And then I threw up every two hours for a day and a half. <laughs> it's like the stress of it. And having just eaten basically Colin the Caterpillars and Diet Coke for an entire day to prepare for it, which is not, <laughs> that's not a healthy diet. It will get you through exams, kids, but it's not a good diet. But yeah, it, it, yeah. I made poor choices, but it got me to a place I was happy with. That's amazing. In terms of listeners that may not be um, familiar with with a thousand ships, would you be able to give them a quick overview of um, the, the sort of narrative? Yeah, it's the Trojan War, but told from uh, it's a polyphonic novel. Um, so lots of voices. Um, it's told from the perspectives of of all the women, or at least a large number of the women whose lives are affected by the war. So the goddesses who conspire to cause the war, um, the Trojan women whose city is um, besieged at the start of the novel, um, the Greek women who are waiting for their husbands, sons, fathers to come home from, from Troy, a 10-year war. Um, and the timelines run in opposite directions. So the novel begins with the fall of the city it begins with the horse because i thought you've got to start with the bit everyone knows start with the horse and then the causation timeline runs backwards the consequences timeline runs forwards and it changes voice every time it's all fine there's a list of characters at the beginning you'll be fine <laughs> that sounds that sounds great derek you got a copy haven't you in yeah yeah it's, it, it's been my uh, my travel book for the last few few months Aww. um I, I'm, I'm a terrible terrible reader when it comes to reading things quickly i tend to dip in and out over the space of a year so a novel takes me about a year to get through yeah um, i'm like that now and no one ever believes it because i judged the booker in whatever year it was so i had to read a, a novel a day for Good Lord. <laughs> uh, uh, 151 books in 204 days to be precise Oof. so i can do it but i'm not gonna <laughs> like, i'm too tired a novel now. a day keeps the doctor right. away is that the uh, thing no it's the opposite right. yeah it keeps the optician <laughs> in business i think is how that ends all right yes <laughs> we, we've we've which touched on there some some great things that you're particularly particularly proud of and both both great great things to to bring up is there anything that you've you've observed or come across that that you you might be particularly particularly envious of in terms of other people's oh, work loads. or discoveries or anything like that yeah loads and loads i really wish that i well at the very most basic bit i wish i knew more languages and then i would be able to read more things and so I'm jealous of everybody who's got languages that I don't have it's so irritating having ancient Greek but not modern and having Latin but not Italian and yes before you write in I do see I could set aside the time to do it but I have so many deadlines <laughs> I'm not sure I've got time to read any more things in a day without my eyes giving out entirely um and in terms of other people's work I mean anything any any visual art things are a kind of a bit of a mystery to me I love writing about art but I don't have skill at all I can't draw or paint and I know people will say everyone can they can't <laughs> not everyone can some people can't um and so that's always a, a huge kind of and uh, god it would be so lovely to be able to sculpt wouldn't it I would love to be able to make things in in three dimensions like that and I always feel like I always talk about the structure of novels as sculpture it's like it's this shape um but the idea of being able to see a block of marble and turn it into an object it just I genuinely don't understand it. I can read about it. I can look at, you know, when you see those, the unfinished slaves the, um, that are in Florence and you can see the kind of work in progress. And you're like, I'm looking at how to do it and I still don't understand how to do it. How, what, what? And every now and then you find, you know, books that work that way too. And so I kind of think, I wonder what it'd be like to be able to write, you know, every sentence a perfect beautiful crafted jewel like julian barnes can or you know i wonder what it's like to be able to write that kind of future fiction where it's sort of now but it's sort of a different version of now with tech from now but slightly differently like margaret atwood can or ishiguro can and you know 
It's sort of extraordinary, isn't it? As as part of your research that you mentioned with regards to writing your books and 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 what on your novels, um, is there a bit of artwork or sculpture that or cave art that you mentioned earlier that you've you've come across that's particularly caught your your attention or your taking your breath? I'm on? constantly fickle, and so my um, most recent favourite is this beautiful owl that's about this size in the Acropolis Museum in Athens, and. It's so lovely, this beautiful sculpted owl. And every time I see it, I'm like, I I don't think you're a proper museum nerd unless you have a little Thomas Crown moment when you go in and think, what would I steal? Not that I would steal, <laughs> but if I did steal, what would I take? If, like in the Capitoline Museum, there's a beautiful little bronze bird on a branch that, you know, I know there are more glamorous and more, you know, famous things there, but that's what I want. So, and also it would fit in a bag. Not that I would take it. I'm just saying I would like it. Um, and that owl in the crop, man, I love an owl. So, yeah, or a gorgon head, uh, any gorgon head. Um, but I'd really like the one at Corsaira, I think. Um, Corfu to give it its slightly more modern name. Um, the um, Medusa that's on the Temple of Artemis there. Well, it's in the Archaeological Museum now, um, I believe. But uh, yeah, I'd like, yeah. But not that I would take it because it would take, <laughs> it's probably the size of my flat. I think. But, yeah. It's funny, you've got me now thinking about what artifacts I'd steal from museums across See, the globe, which is start, great. <laughs> it, and, you know, you can obviously have a bonus go when there's a special exhibition and you're like, oh, well, what would I take from the Pompeii and Herculaneum exhibition? Oh, well, which oh, yeah. would I want? And so on. And it's like, so long as you don't take it, it's fine. Museums you've are going to be a treat now. <laughs> you've got uh, you've given me an adult version of a game I used to play as a child. So I had a very uneventful and um, and very simple upbringing. But the, the, I'd spend many a weekend going through the Argos catalogue because that was the Bible when yeah, you were a kid, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And you could choose one item on every page, and that was yours. So you sat there with my sisters, like you would turn the page, and it was as quick as you can you pointed it and you get to keep that thing it never never got any of it it was just a, <laughs> just a, a lovely imaginary game so maybe now every time i go into a room in a museum i'm gonna bah! i'm gonna have i'm gonna have the owl i'm gonna have the yeah the marbles whatever it might be <laughs> yeah i find it kind of heartening that um almost always you don't go for the kind of big showpiece item mm. you know you almost always almost always something small that that kind of grabs you and, and mm. that you really really long for and often I find it's things where you can see the where, you know, you can see how much someone else has touched it. I love, you know, ancient coins where you can see that they've been rubbed smooth. And, oh, I just, I love that sense. That I know you guys get this all the time, but for classicists, it's still slightly novel to be able to see it. But then, you know, there was a fantastic chunk of um, Seneca's apocolicentosis, the um, pumpkinification of the divine Claudius, um, they had a manuscript of it at the British Museum last year. And, uh, man, that was quite something. You go, ooh, look at that. Would I take that? I might take that. <laughs> oh, I love it. And, yeah, that's my next trip to Greece. Absolutely sorted out now. I'm going to stroll around all of the museums and pick pick the things I'm going to steal. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, touched, you touched on there, Natalie, just, just briefly before we move on to the next question, that um, as a classicist uh, and the envy of us as archaeologists getting to see finds and artefacts and then, yeah, you know, me and Derek are just kicking gold coins out the way left right and center when we're doing our work <laughs> that's certainly how i always think of these. Yeah. <laughs> how how was your time team experience because i mean that's if, if in terms, fewer gold coins yeah, than i was hoping for yeah, yeah, not gonna sure. lie but i mean that's a pretty good baptism of pure archaeology you, you turn up on site and there are trenches open everywhere there are typical archaeological types all over the place uh, two generic bearded <laughs> over enthusiastic bearded archaeologists um sort of asking irritating questions but in terms of the archaeology and the reason i asked this when we were out in greece in november we had a classicist out with us who hadn't done much field work experience before but absolutely loved it and immediately saw the application to his work and and sort of but also brought loads of great experience and knowledge to our work and i was just wondering how 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 time team was and whether it was something completely new for you or it was completely new i'd never been to a site before i'd never been to a dig before ever um so you know i'd read about it written about it occasionally but i'd never been to a site i'd never had an actual trowel in in my you know slightly inept hand um 
And it, it, I really, really loved the kind of physicality of it. I felt sort of out of my depth the first weekend because we were doing like non-Roman, um, so Iron Age. It's like, I don't know anything about the Iron Age. I shouldn't really be admitting this uh, for the program goes out. But I don't know anything about Iron Age Britain. Um, my speciality is Greece and a bit Rome. Um, and so I was so much more in my comfort zone the second the second um, dig where we were in a you know Roman Britain site and it's like oh yeah no I, I at least know the world I you know I still don't know how the kind of physical site works I still don't understand loads of things about it but I at least know what we're aiming for whereas you know when it's just tunnels and it's like well what are they for no one knows they might be ceremonial all right I can't help <laughs> I don't I don't really know um whereas you know it's like well this is a Roman Britain site and we've got this and we've got this like, oh yeah okay great Nice. Mm. So, is there any particular highlights from the two? Anything that leaps out? Anything? We need to be careful of spoilers here. Yeah, I don't want to get in trouble. Yeah, I don't want to get in trouble <laughs> without spoilers. Yeah. Obviously, I really liked it. I mean, I didn't. I've never dealt with any of the kind of um, geophysics stuff before. I've never looked at the landscape in that kind of assessing way. That you know, you suddenly it's like, oh, okay, so this thing isn't just you know a hill. It's a feature. This is designed rather than has occurred and that was incredible and honestly just getting to use a metal detector was fun i've never done it before it was yeah all of it was fun all of it was you know amazing and different and so you know i got to make a fresco it was so cool probably not allowed to say nice that was super cool and fingers crossed we get to do some more in the in the coming coming months with any luck so um bringing us back away from time team now back to career and ruins um as 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 our regular listener will know um we've got a working time machine uh which we give a ticket to all of our guests a return ticket to go somewhere in the past and you can drop into a few places on the way if you want to if you're going to the same place um it's we're pretty flexible with the rules i think um but if you had one ticket in a time machine if you had a return ticket where would you go and why yeah that's a really difficult one generally when people ask about time travel i um the other side of the bit of me that um co-presents the seventh dimension on radio 4 extra the sci-fi strand wins out and i think i'd rather go to the future because you know here's what i like medicine a vote i don't really fancy (laughs) the past that much (laughs) it looks quite stressful so i mean it would be really hard to say no to fifth century athens um just to you know be in it and get the feel of somewhere that was just undergoing you know i know we um would would scoff now at the sort of notion of the greek miracle um but it for sure underwent the most incredible you know i'm trying so hard not to use highlander language and say the quickening but it is isn't it they're just nicking <laughs> stuff from all over the place like money and alphabets and you know thought from and, and then you know suddenly all this stuff just you know a huge melting pot of idea and and creativity and to have seen you know Aeschylus's first tragedy to have seen Euripides's first tragedy my god so yeah would I go maybe I'd go to 431 to see the first performance of Medea I think that that might be the most specific date we've had which is well I really like the play (laughs) what do you want me to say (laughs) but generally I'm going to go to the future and then I'm going to have medicine and a vote (laughs) I say with blithe expectation of a good future you're not allowed to stay it's a return trip (laughs) okay for our day trip then for whatever day of the Dionysia it was in 431 I, I, I'm trying to think back to podcast past. I think it was Chris Stantis who, when we when we offered her a trip in the time machine, her first question was, um, "Do I have to be a woman? Because that would probably be shit." Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's the issue, isn't it? I might not have been allowed at the diners here. I'd have had to be disguised as a boy, not for the first time. I might add. Um, so yeah, let's hope that my you know nineties grunge lesbian look would work well in fifth century BC Athens. Nothing to see here. <laughs> my cloth <Mm-mm>. shirt. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> excellent natalie thank you so much for your time um this evening um it's been my pleasure it, yeah a really nice and new and fresh take for a career in ruins interview and um probably the most last we've had doing one as well so thank you for that yeah yeah <laughs> I mean, I've literally trained for this. It's supposed to happen. <laughs> <laughs> 
it, it'll be a surprise to our regular listeners, though. To, <laughs> yeah. to, to have a yeah. laugh. Sorry. Work in the mold. Thanks a lot, man. <laughs> Next week, we have our uh, normal uh, standard, uh, very boring podcast. Do, do tune in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, um, no, that, that's brilliant. Thank you so, so much, Natalie. And thank you, everybody, for listening. Um, again, a huge shout out to all our Patreon fans who have supported the podcast over the last three years. Um, this, this series is very much possible because of you. Um, we have another three podcasts in the diary already over the next two weeks and um and two or three more lined up after that hopefully so do stay tuned i think i think our next one is john gator geophysics extraordinaire so um (laughs) so uh do tune in it'll be interesting the godfather of geophysics (laughs) 